In the last video, we talked about an example which I have here, where when we assess the heterogeneity using these values here of the chi-squared and the i-squared, we found no evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the studies that were included in the meta-analysis were estimating the same effect. Once we'd made that inference, that enabled us to then go to the next step of the meta-analysis and calculate the summary risk ratio or the summary effect measure, where we took the point estimates from each study and weighted them by a measure of their precision. Now notice that this software prints everything for you. Then you have to go and make the interpretation. For example, here, even though this is now the example of the seroprevalence of cattle and buffalo, even though there's strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis of homogeneity and say actually there is evidence of heterogeneity, that would suggest that we should not calculate a summary effect measure, although I'm not sure that's actually correct. But the software will still calculate one in any case. So the software just does the calculations. It doesn't do the thinking for you about how you should interpret it. So I'm going back now to the example I had before where I do have a summary effect measure and evidence that I have uh, that I should not reject the null hypothesis. This is the example that I was looking at before. And I ended up with an estimate of 0 0.8 with a 95% confidence of 0 0.63 to 1.01. That's in my table. If I look over here on my forest plot, you'll see that I have a large diamond. This, di this is a diamond as opposed to the squares. The diamond traditionally represents the summary effect measure on a forest plot. The vertical axis of the diamond recommends represents the point estimate. So this vertical axis occurs at 0 0.8. On the horizontal axis, the points of the diamond represent the 95% confidence interval. And you'll see here that almost the entire 95% confidence interval is on the side of the plot that favours the vaccine. So it looks like the vaccine, on average, should be expected to be effective. Now you're going to be asking me about this one study here that has a study that shows that the vaccine was not effective. But remember that that study is known with great imprecision and therefore it doesn't contribute enormously to the weighting and doesn't contribute enormously to this estimate. Now, the next question in the meta-analysis is, is this estimate statistically significant? Now, in truth, you should have learned in your epidemiology class that significance testing is not necessarily a very good tool. I'm going to show you how to do it, but I think that this is a good example where you would be foolhardy to rely on significance testing. So here we have a study that's showing that there's a 20% decrease in the risk ratio. And so we have 0 0.8. And its confidence interval just barely includes one. So if it was me, I would be inclined to say there is evidence that this vaccine is effective. But we can test that using a p-value. And so we can do it an overall test for the effect. What this test is doing is asking the question, is the risk ratio equal to one? In exactly the same way that you did in a basic epidemiology class. You would have asked using a mantle hansel analysis whether the risk ratio was equal to one. But this time it's asking whether the summary risk ratio is equal to one. We have the Z statistic here, it's 1.89, and the p-value for that is 0 
Now, some people, if they use significance testing, would say this is larger than 0.05 and therefore it must not be statistically significant. However, I would say that that is a very inappropriate and kind of immature approach to looking at the data. The body of work, most of the studies suggested there's an effect. When you combine them, it just barely includes one. And so really I would say that there's moderate evidence that this is effective. And I'm sure you learned in your epi class that it would be far more helpful to report this summary effect measure and its 95% confidence interval than to just tell people that it was not statistically significant because such an approach to interpreting data is um, it leaves a lot of information hidden. So just to remind you of the three things that we've done so far in the meta-analysis. First of all, we've assessed whether there's evidence of homogeneity. In fact, what we're doing is we assume there's homogeneity and we're going to reject that null hypothesis. And we've had two examples, one where we didn't reject the null hypothesis and one when we did. That was the first step in our meta-analysis. The next step, if we had evidence of no heterogeneity, was to calculate the summary effect measure. The summary effect measure was the weighted average of the effect measures in each study. So we calculated this summary effect measure here, 0.8. And then the third step was to test whether the summary effect measure was different from the null hypothesis. And because this is the risk ratio, the null hypothesis is that the risk ratio is equal to one. So there are the three steps we've done. We could do that for any effect estimate. So I'm going to change this now. It's going to go to the risk difference. And you can see that there is substantial evidence of a risk difference heterogeneity. And this is not coming as a surprise. We tend not to use the risk difference in vaccine studies because it's affected by the baseline. In this situation, you would not calculate a summary risk difference. Now I'm going to change it to the odds ratio. And you'll see that the odds ratio, not surprisingly, is further from the null than the risk ratio. That always happens. There are many papers that you can read on explaining why that is, unless the disease is very, very rare. Now for the odds ratio, we see that there's even less evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And so we would go on to calculate the summary odds ratio. And once we have the summary odds ratio, the third thing we would do is interpret this test of overall effect. And the p-value is 0.05. And so as I've mentioned, my approach would be to report to the end users this number here. And I know I said last time I was going to talk about subgroups and I didn't in this video. It's going to be in the next video.